The Textile Industry Table of Contents Preface All about the development of the textile industry, which was the first major industry of the Industrial Revolution. Dr. Sidney Socloff Dr. Sidney22 at gmail.com 2023 Narration by Dr. Sidney Socloff Zoe Phonemes and Nathan Coltov For a complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to tiny.one slash yt navigator. The birth of the modern world and its attendant industrial revolution was not a sudden event or revolution in the sense of happening over a short span of time, such as days, months, or a few years, but although very short in terms of the many millennia of human history, evolved over a period of hundred years, or more, and indeed is still going on, and indeed at an ever increasingly rapid pace. For many thousands of years, things did not change much at all. Then, around 200 years ago things started to change at an increasingly rapid rate. And today we have the amazing modern world with changes happening almost every day. If I had to pick out one specific date as the birthday of the modern world, I would choose the easily remembered year of 1776. It was in 1776 that James Newton had the idea of an efficient steam engine. Adam Smith, in his book, Wealth of Nations, expressed a new way of looking at what was wealth, free enterprise market systems, and Thomas Jefferson, and others, wrote of political freedom, freedom of the individual, and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In the feudal system of fixed classes, the illiterate peasants did not have the means or the ability to produce the changes. The nobility had no interest in change, nor did the clergy or the knights. It was only the emerging new merchant class that had the means, knowledge and interest. Although these concepts happened in the era of 1776, the effect did not start to become felt until years or even decades later. So we can use 1776 as a memorable starting point. However, the real impact was not felt until the very late 1800s and early 1900s. In particular, it was until 1785 that Edmund Cartwright developed a steam-powered loom. And this marked the transition of textiles from a cottage industry to the modern concept of a factory-based industry. Also. The first railroad came in being in 1825, which allowed for materials to be transported to the factories, and the finished products to be distributed far and wide. This is James Watt. This is Hero of Alexandria. This is Adam Smith. This is Thomas Jefferson. This is Thomas Newcomen. This is the opening of the Stockton and Darlington Railway in 1825. One of the most spectacular features of the Industrial Revolution was the introduction of power-driven machinery in the textile industries of England and Scotland. This took place between 1750 and 1800 and marked the beginning of the age of the modern factory. The three essential components of life or economic sectors in the pre-modern era were food, shelter, and clothing. Food was always an activity that was not amenable to centralized factory-style production. Whether it was a hunter-gatherer existence or settled agriculture and animal husbandry, it was a spread out situation and not suitable for mechanization until very late in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Shelter in the form of housing and buildings in general is also an activity that is difficult to centralize production. 
and generally does not lend itself to large-scale mechanized production. Additionally, the low-value pay unit weight makes transportation of the finished product not economical. An exception in more recent days is the manufactured homes industry. The production of clothing in the pre-modern era was an activity that required much time and effort. From the production of the raw material such as cotton, wool, flax, or silk, to the spinning of threads, weaving, dyeing, and sewing. These were all laborious tasks that took up a major fraction of time for both men and women in terms of monetary value for the time expended. Clothing of all sorts was very expensive. Although the production of clothing was a major part of the textile industry, there were other products as well, including bedding towels, tablecloths, wall hangings, flags, banners, and rugs. However, the production of clothing and other textile products is a major sector of the economy that can benefit greatly from centralized and highly capitalized production using power machinery. In addition, Developments in transportation with canals, railroads, and steamships made regional, national, and global distribution possible, as well as the influx of raw materials needed for production. The three important components of life or economic sectors in the PH modern era were food, shelter, and clothing. In the modern era a fourth sector of the economy has become dominant, that of the service sector. In industrialized countries, the service sector accounts for more than half of the GDP. In the United States 70% of the workforce works in the service sector. In Japan, 60%. And in Taiwan, 50%. Why I look at textiles in the discussion of the making of the modern world? It was the production of textiles that led the way in terms of the development of the factory system of centralized production. With the high capitalization of high-speed steam-powered production equipment. There were the factors of high value per unit weight. Textiles was the first major industry to use mechanized production with high speeds and throughput. Centralized production with the factory system. It was amenable to mechanization. Unlike agriculture or construction, the feedstock cotton was transported to factories by steamship and rail. The final product was transported to consumers by steamship and rail. Production One of the essential features of the modern world is production, high volume, low cost production. That is to a large extent very high volume and very low per unit cost production. Almost everything we have is the result of this. Capital investment in production machinery and infrastructure. Centralized production and regional. National. And then global distribution made possible by canals. Railroads. Trucks and highways and containerized shipping with huge cargo ships. Centralized production, for some goods. Production has become centralized into just a few factories that supply the entire world. It's for example automobiles, commercial airliners, and computer, microprocessor, chips. For computer chips, the rigorous and very high technology requirements of high precision and ultra-clean environments require capital investments in the billion-dollar range. Some plants cost as much as $30 billion. The large computer chip plants can produce in the range of 100,000 to 500,000 silicon wafers per month. These wafers are 300 millimeters in diameter. This results in 30 to 75 million chips per month each measuring 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters, yielding from 360 million to almost 1 billion chips annually.
The very high value per unit weight of the chips means that the transportation costs of the finished product are almost negligible. So, a single factory can economically supply the entire world. Although there are almost 200 countries in the world, there are perhaps only a few factories producing computer chips. The cost of producing a million chips is not much more than the cost of making just one. At the other extreme, let us consider the production of large commercial jetliners, such as the Boeing 747 and the Airbus A380. There are only two companies, namely Boeing and Airbus, that produce these large commercial airplanes in the world with the final assembly plants located in just a few places. In this case, the final product is so exceptionally large and complex that the capital investment is so very large that these two companies supply the entire world. The Airbus A380 is the largest commercial airplane ever built, with a passenger capacity of 800 and a cost of $450 million. The development cost for the Airbus was $25 billion. Before the industrialization of the textile industry, merchants purchased raw materials and distributed them among workers who lived in cottages on farms or in villages. Some workers spun the plant in animal fibers into yarn, and others wove the yarn into cloth. This system was called domestic or cottage industry. Under the domestic system, merchants bought as much material and employed as many workers as they needed. The merchants financed the entire operation. Some of them owned the spinning and weaving equipment in the workers' cottages. However, the workers had much independence and set their own pace of work. Sometimes they hired help and had apprentices. They often accepted work from several merchants at the same time. The domestic system presented many problems for the merchants. They had difficulty regulating standards of workmanship and maintaining schedules for completing work. Workers sometimes sold some of the yarn or cloth for their own profit. As the demand for cloth increased, Merchants often had to compete with one another for the limited number of workers available in a manufacturing district. All these problems increased the merchants' costs. As a result, the merchants turned increasingly to machinery for greater production and to factories for central control of their workers. Agriculture as well as rural industry began to feel the changes brought about by the industrialization of textile manufacturing. To meet the increased demand for textiles and other products, landowners began raising raw materials rather than food on their land. The size of farms increased. Many farms were organized along industrial lines. There was a large increase in capital investment in agriculture. Standards of farm management improved. The quality of livestock and crop seed also improved greatly. It was cotton that was the principal raw material of the revolution in textiles. It was these three factors that formed the basis of the Industrial Revolution. There was a synergistic relationship between these three. Steam power was needed to power the new textile mills and to supply transportation of the raw materials. Coal, limestone, and iron ore to the iron smelting furnaces. It was iron, and later steel, that was needed to build the steam engines, locomotives, and the rails for the railroads, and the machinery for the textile mills. The newly developed machinery for the textile mill spurred the development of the precision metal working machine tool industry that made possible improvements in the steam engines and railroads. The initial breakthrough in the use of steam power machinery occurred in the British textile industry. This was centered in the Lancashire district of Western England. This shows the location of the Lancashire district of Western England.
This is the iron and steel industry in Britain in the century of 1715 to 1815. First, the changes were modest and on a small scale. Mechanical looms, powered by flowing water were invented. Industries remained largely rural, and factories were located mainly next to rapidly flowing streams. Later in the 18th century, the invention of the steam engine provided a better source of power in the United States. Textile plants were the first factories. These are the basic steps in textile manufacturing. First, is the cotton growing and harvesting. Then the cleaning and removal of seeds. Cardling, which is the straightening of the fibers. Spinning into threads. Weaving. Dyeing and sewing. This shows the cotton growing and harvesting. This is the transportation of the cotton. Then comes the cleaning and removal of the seeds. The straightening of the fibers is called carding. Then comes cotton spinning. For weaving, there were first hand looms and then weaving machines. Then comes the dyeing process. There was a great progress in sewing from the very laborious hand sewing to the invention of the sewing machine by Elias Howe in 1846. Spinning machines For hundreds of years before the Industrial Revolution, spinning had been done in the home on a simple device called a spinning wheel. One person operated the wheel, powering it with a foot pedal. The spinning wheel produced only one thread at a time. The first spinning machines were crude devices that often broke the fragile threads. In 1738, Lewis Paul, a Middlesex inventor, and John Wyatt, a Litchfield mechanic, patented an improved roller spinning machine. This machine pulled the strands of material through sets of wooden rollers that moved at different speeds, making some strands tighter than others. When combined, these strands were stronger than strands of uniform tightness. The combined strands passed onto the flyer, the part of the machine that twisted the strands into yarn. The finished yarn was wound onto a bobbin that revolved on a spindle. Mechanically, the roller spinning machine was not completely successful. However, it was the first step in the industrialization of textile manufacturing. The textile industry. Textiles are cloths or fabrics. It was the first to be industrialized. Great Britain had learned a lot about textiles from India and China. The birth and growth of the textile industry. In the early 18th century, British textile manufacture was based on wool which was processed by individual artisans, doing the spinning and weaving on their own premises. This system is called a cottage industry. Flax and cotton were also used for fine materials, but the processing was difficult because of the pre-processing needed. Thus goods in these materials made only a small proportion of the output. In the 1700s, three new machines revolutionized the textile industry. First was the flying shuttle in 1733 by John Kay. Then in 1765 was the spinning jenny, invented by James Hargreaves. This was a machine that spun thread eight times faster than by hand. In 1769, the water frame, invented by C. Richard Arkwright, greatly increased the production of thread. John Kay of Lancashire, England invented the flying shuttle in 1733. This hand-operated device greatly increased the speed of weaving. The flying shuttle was one of the key developments in weaving that helped fuel the Industrial Revolution. It was patented by John Kay, 1704 to 1764, in 1733. 
It was controlled by a lever and only one weaver controlled this motion. Prior to this invention weavers used to weave by hand and could only weave a fabric no wider than an arm's length. If this length exceeded the maximum, two people would be needed. But the flying shuttle could weave much wider than an arm's length and in much greater speeds. This is a flying shuttle showing the metal captains, wheels, and a pern of weft thread. A pern is a rod onto which weft thread is wound for use in weaving. The shuttle not only increased the speed of weaving, but also allowed weaving over a broader loom by one person rather than requiring two. We will next have a short video clip of John Kay's flying shuttle. This loom got a piece of kit invented in 1733 by one John Kay that doubled the output of these looms and it was this. The flying shuttle. So instead of throwing the shuttle through the warp, you can now just whack it across. And the weavers would keep it in the family. The children carding, the women winding bobbins and spinning, and the men up here weaving. The flying shuttle was a major breakthrough. Weavers could now earn a living. In 1764, James Hargreaves invented a multi-spool spinning wheel called the spinning jenny. The spinning jenny dramatically reduced the amount of work needed to produce yarn. A single worker could now work eight or more spools at once, and ultimately improved models of the spinning jenny had 120 spools. The spinning jenny is a multi-spool spinning frame. It was invented about 1764 by James Hargreaves near Lancashire in England. The device reduced the amount of work needed to produce yarn with a worker able to work eight or more spools at once. This grew to 120 as technology advanced. We will next have a short video clip of Hargreaves' spinning jenny. The spinning wheel increased spinner's output. But it wasn't until 1764, when Lancastrian James Hargreaves had a brainwave, that spinners could really step up production. His invention was the spinning jenny. The spinning jenny worked on the same principle as the spinning wheel. Here we have the rovings, the unspun cotton, and that's thread on there, and this is how we get it. I pull it back, we pull off the bobbin here, okay? And then we trap it between those two pieces of wood there. So this now is stationary. This spindle at the end is connected to all the other ones which are connected to this wheel. And as we wind this wheel, it's a quite a, a knack this, but you'll see it comes off the spindle like that. And as it flicks off the top, it's putting a spin into the roving. And because the rest of it's stationary, it's clamped here, and this isn't moving, it's spinning. OK. And we've now got spun thread between here and there. So this is the complicated bit. <laughs> what we have to do is go backwards a bit and take that off and then put the guide wire down like that and then moving forward quickly the other way we wind it on bingo mechanically simple economically breathtakingly sophisticated because what happened was that 120 spindle machine this is a 30 spindle machine 
on four draws, that's backwards and forwards four times, could spin half a mile of cotton. So in the old days, six spinners would work to supply one weaver. Now, one man spinning on this could supply eight weavers. Cash. The Jenny took cotton out of the home and into the workshops, sounding the death knell for spinning as a cottage industry. Between 1774 and 1779, a Lancashire weaver named Samuel Crompton developed the spinning mule. The spinning mule combined features of the spinning Jenny and the water frame and, in time, replaced both machines. The mule was particularly efficient in spinning fine yarn for high quality cloth, which, before the invention of the mule, had been imported from India. During the 1780s and 1790s, larger spinning mules were built. They had metal rollers and several hundred spindles. These machines ended the home spinning industry. We will next have a short video clip of a working spinning mule. The spinning mule was used to spin cotton and other fibers in the mills of Lancashire and elsewhere during the 19th and early 20th centuries. And at its peak there were 50 million mule spindles in Lancashire alone. The carriage carried up to 1320 spindles and could be 150 feet long. A water frame is a spinning frame that is powered by a water wheel. Richard Arkwright patented a water frame in 1769 that could spin 96 threads at a time. The water frame is the name that was given to the spinning frame when water power was used to drive it. We will next have a short video clip of Richard Arkwright's water frame. It began with water-powered machines. For centuries, people had used the turning force of water wheels to help with tough jobs, like driving blades for sawing wood. And rotating coarse stones for grinding grain into flour. But eventually, Water wheels began to power more complicated devices that would revolutionize cloth making, like this carding machine. What an improvement over the pet brushes. And by rolling out wispy slivers all day long, it was a great labor-saving device. But this was even better. I'm standing next to a machine called a water frame. It was created by the famous English inventor Richard Arkwright, this model's from the 1780s, to spin cotton into yarn. Though it looks fairly complex, it really isn't. It runs on water power, just like the carding machine and saw blades we saw earlier. The cotton in the top spools is drawn out by the action of the machine, which twists it nice and tight, and then gathers the yarn onto these bottom spools. It works just like a hand spinning wheel. Ninety-six of them, actually. So it's little wonder that spinning by machine would eventually make spinning by hand obsolete. In no time, spinning mills began springing up all over England.
entrepreneurs, of which the most famous is Richard Arkwright, capitalized on the advances in spinning and weaving. Arkwright nurtured the inventors, patented the ideas, financed the initiatives, and protected the machines. Richard Arkwright created the cotton mill which brought the production processes together in a factory. Arkwright developed the use of power, first horsepower and then water power, which made cotton manufacture a mechanized industry. Later steam power was applied to drive textile machinery. This factory was built by C. Richard Arkwright in an architecturally elegant style. It was built in 1783 to 1784 just outside Cromford. Cromford was isolated. So Arkwright created a small town with a market, an inn and dwellings. The town provided a new way of living and working as employees had to adjust to the rhythm of the machine. It is remarkable that this 18th century town survived virtually intact when other monuments of early industrialization did not, such as Matthew Bolton's Soho Works in Handsworth. Since 2001, Cromford has been part of the Derwent Valley Mills World Heritage Site. This recognizes its importance as a monument to Richard Arkwright and the factory system. Cromford is also a physical record of industrial capitalism and the patterns of time management work discipline and social control which form part of the contemporary world. The first textile mills appeared in Great Britain in the 1740s. By the 1780s, England had 120 mills, and several had been built in Scotland. We will next have a short video clip of Richard Arkwright's Cotton Raleigh. And Lancastrian barber and wig maker Richard Arkwright had come up with an invention that was going to revolutionise the cotton industry. To keep his machine a secret so that he could make his fortune, he set up shop miles from traditional centres of cotton production, here in leafy Cromford in Derbyshire. And this is his invention. This is an original of 1803, so can't be used. But... This is a replica, with four spindles instead of 48. As you can see, it's quite a simple machine. Turning the belt drive draws the yarn through the three sets of rollers, rotating at different speeds determined by the gearing mechanism. The weights put the stretching yarn under different degrees of tension. The second roller runs at twice the speed of the first roller, stretching the yarn to twice its length. Then the third roller runs at twice the speed again, so doubling the length of the cotton again. Finally, the spinning spindle puts the twist in the yarn. It's quite a beautiful action. Through trial and error, Arkwright worked out the critical distance between rollers. The length of cotton staple being only two and a half centimetres, any less than that, and the fibres would break. Longer than seven centimetres, and it would be too weak. Maybe years of curling wigs gave him the idea. The rollers, the top being leather covered, and the bottom metal and splined, gave the right amount of friction and the front weights stopped the yarn twisting before it had been stretched. There's no great leap in technology here. This is the logical application of current knowledge. This replica was built by a local clock... After the development of the spinning mule by Samuel Crompton, another major development was the power loom by Edmund Cartwright. In 1785, an Anglican clergyman named Edmund Cartwright developed a steam power loom. Other British machine makers made further improvements in the steam power loom during the early 1800s. A power loom is a mechanized loom powered by a line shaft. By 1835, 
Great Britain had more than 120,000 power looms, most used to weave cotton. After the mid-1800s, hand looms were used only to make fancy pattern cloth, which still could not be made on power looms. The power loom was refined over the years until a design by James Bullough and William Kenworthy in 1842 made the operation completely automatic. This was known as the Lancashire loom, and by 1850 there were 260,000 in operation in England. By 1895, a fully automatic power loom was developed known as the Northrop loom. It replaced the shuttle when empty with another one without stopping. We will next have a short video clip of steam put we in textile mills. Steam power had finally arrived in the textile industry. And this is what the boilers are generating steam for. It's a tandem because there are two cylinders, one in front of the other, like a bike. Compound because the steam is used more than once. Condensing because downstairs is James Watt's separate condenser creating a partial vacuum. In this, the big cylinder. Steam engine. All right, Owen. It develops 500 horsepower and it drives this four meter diameter flywheel. And I can feel the air off that. This engine, powered by coal, transported on the canal, was built by Roberts of Nelson in 1894 and drives the looms of this Lancashire cotton mill. Mesmerising, isn't it? That's the crosshead. Connecting rod to the crank there, which is turning the wheel. All that power. And you look down here, and these are going the wrong way. What's that all about? Well, what's happening? Are they going against the piston movement? Is that he's controlling the inlet valves and the exhaust valves? So it's got to work against the piston because you've got to put the steam in behind it. Hang on a minute. <laughs> right. Okay. So that's coming backwards and lifting. Every time it lifts, that's an ejection of steam behind the, the piston one way and the other side of the other. Okay, so what's happening down there? Well, you've got to get rid of the steam as well. So these are the exhaust valves. Ah, but they look like they're both going the same way. And you think, oh, that's not right. But they're set at 180 degrees. So when one's open, the other one's closed. So the rod can just work together. Good, isn't it? And this is my favourite bit. Dancing metal. Two major advances in textiles were made by American inventors. Eli Whitney for the cotton gin and Elias Howe for the sewing machine. Eli Whitney, 1765 to 1825, was an American inventor best known for inventing the cotton gin. This was one of the key inventions of the Industrial Revolution and shaped the economy of the antebellum South. Whitney's invention made upland short cotton into a profitable crop, which strengthened the economic foundation of slavery in the United States, regardless of whether Whitney intended that or not. Despite the social and economic impact of his invention, Whitney lost many profits in legal battles over patent infringement for the cotton gin. After that, 
Whitney turned his attention to securing contracts with the government in the manufacture of muskets for the newly formed Continental Army. He continued making arms and inventing until his death in 1825. A cotton gin, short for cotton engine, is a machine that quickly and easily separates the cotton fibers from the seeds. A job formerly performed by hand. The fibers are processed into cotton goods, and the seeds may be used to grow more cotton, to produce cotton seed oil, or, if they are badly damaged, are disposed of. The gin uses a combination of a wire screen and small wire hooks to pull the cotton through, while brushes continuously remove the loose cotton lint to prevent jams. The invention of the cotton gin caused massive growth of the production of cotton in the United States, concentrated mostly in the South. Cotton production expanded from 750,000 bales in 1830 to 2.85 million bales in 1850. As a result, the South became even more dependent on plantations and slavery making plantation agriculture the largest sector of the southern economy. In addition to the increase in cotton production, the number of slaves rose as well, from around 700,000, before Eli Whitney's patent, to around 3.2 million in 1850. By 1860 the United States South was providing 80% of Great Britain's cotton and two-thirds of the entire world's supply of cotton. Cotton had formerly required considerable labo to clean and separate the fibers from the seeds. The cotton gin revolutionized the process. With Eli Whitney's introduction of teeth in his cotton gin to coal mount the cotton and separate the seeds, cotton became a tremendously profitable business, creating many fortunes in the antebellum South. Cotton had formerly required considerable labor to clean and separate the fibers from the seeds. The cotton gin revolutionized the process. New Orleans and Galveston were shipping points that derived substantial economic benefits from cotton raised throughout the South. Elias Howe invented the sewing machine in 1846. In 1885 Singer produced its first vibrating shuttle sewing machine an improvement over contemporary oscillating shuttle designs. Use of the spinning wheel and hand loom restricted the production capacity of the industry, but incremental advances increased productivity to the extent that manufactured cotton goods became the dominant British export by the early decades of the 19th century. India was displaced as the premier supplier of cotton goods other inventors increased the efficiency of the individual steps of spinning, cardling, twisting and spinning, and rolling, so that the supply of yarn increased greatly, which fed a weaving industry that was advancing with improvements to shuttles and the loomer frame. The output of an individual laborer increased dramatically, with the effect that the new machines were seen as a threat to employment and early innovators were attacked and their inventions destroyed. The number of looms in England increased by a factor of 100 from 1813 to 1850, and the number of textile factory workers increased from 150,000 to over 1 million. The factory system introduced a rigid schedule, a long 12 to 14 who day, dangerous working conditions, and mind-numbing monotony. The Luddites in the period of 1811 to 1816 made attacks on the frames, or power looms. They were named after Ned Ludd, who was a mythical figure, supposed to live in Sherwood Forest. Many textile mills still used water power wherever possible. This shows a typical water-powered textile mill. The power created by the water wheels is delivered to the machinery by gears and belts. To run properly, machines must have their power at the right speed and direction. The water wheel does not necessarily turn at the same speed and direction as the machinery, so gears are used to adjust the speed and direction.
The water flows into the tub. Turning the wheel. The wheel turns the shafts and gears connected to it. Leather belts connect the shafts and the machinery to provide the power to run the machine. The developments in one aspect of the textile production process encouraged and hastened advances in other areas. The great increases in textile production by the power loom resulted in corresponding increases in the demand for cotton. And the production of cotton was greatly advanced by the use of the cotton gin. The machinery requirements of the textile industry led to demands for stronger iron, which led to improvements in iron smelting and the production of steel. Samuel Slater Samuel Slater, 1768-1835, was an early American industrialist known as the father of the American Industrial Revolution and the father of the American factory system because he brought British textile technology to America. He learned textile machinery as an apprentice to a pioneer in the British industry. Samuel Slater brought British textile technology to America where he designed the first textile mills. He then went into business for himself and grew wealthy. By the end of his life he owned 13 spinning mills and had established tenant farms and towns around his textile mills such as Slatersville, Rhode Island. The Slater Mill Historic Site is a National Historic Landmark located next to the Blackstone River in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Samuel Slater, the mill's founder, apprenticed as a young man in England. Shortly after immigrating to the United States, Slater was hired to produce a working set of machines necessary to spin cotton yarn using water power. Construction of the machines as well as a dam, waterway, water wheel and mill, began in 1790 and was completed in 1793. Modeled after cotton spinning mills first established in England, the Slater Mill is the first water-powered cotton spinning mill in North America to utilize the system of cotton spinning developed by Richard Arkwright. Manufacturing was based on Arkwright's cotton spinning system which included carting, drawing, and spinning machines. Slater initially hired children and families to work in his mill, establishing a pattern replicated throughout the Blackstone Valley and known as the Rhode Island System. It was later superseded by Francis Cabot Lowell's Waltham System. This shows the location of the Slater Mill just north of Providence in Rhode Island. Francis Cabot Lowell Francis Cabot Lowell, 1775-1817, was the American businessman for whom the city of Lowell in Massachusetts is named. He was instrumental in bringing the Industrial Revolution to the United States. Boston merchants became interested in textile factories after the War of 1812, showed the advantages of diversification. Francis Cabot Lowell and the Boston Manufacturing Company set up a factory to use power looms. It opened in 1815 as the first complete cotton factory in the U.S. The new factory needed more water power in order to expand and established a new town in Massachusetts called Lowell. The first mill there opened in 1822. Land was cheap in the United States and people wanted to own their own farms and not work in mills. So, the problem was where to find a workforce for a large mill. The solution was to hire young women from the countryside to work for a few years before they get married. Women lived in heavily supervised dormitories, were required to attend church, follow many factory rules, and they made good wages for women at the time. The women averaged $3.60 a week in 1836, but out of it paid $1.50 a week for room and board. This compared favorably to $1 a week for domestic work. Until the mid-1840s the work was not stressful, although they worked 73 hours a week, with a 12 to 14 hour day, six days a week, 
and 309 days a year, with only three holidays. This is the Lowell National Historical Park. This shows the location of the Lowell National Historical Park north of Boston and very close to New Hampshire. This is a map of the Lowell National Historical Park. This is another map of the Lowell National Historical Park. This is another map of the Lowell National Historical Park. This is the Lowell National Historical Park. This is the Lowell National Historical Park. This is the entrance to the Boot Cotton Mills Museum of the Lowell National Historical Park. The Jacquard Loom is a mechanical loom invented by Joseph Marie Jacquard in 1801 that simplifies the process of manufacturing textiles with complex patterns such as brocade and damask. The loom is controlled by punched cards with punched holes each row of which corresponds to one row of the design. Multiple rows of holes are punched on each card, and the many cards that compose the design of the textile are strung together in order. The punched cards of the Jacquard loom represent what is perhaps the earliest example of industrial automation and machine programming. The punched cards of the Jacquard loom are an early predecessor of the punched cards used for computers in the 1980s. How an 1803 Jacquard loom led to computer technology? This is a mechanical jacquard loom. This technology was developed in France in 1803 by a weaver named Joseph Marie Jacquard. The key thing about this loom is that it controls every warp thread, the threads that go from the front to the back of the loom, individually. Because it can do that, the loom can create very complex fancy patterns in the cloth more quickly and with greater accuracy than the technology available before this loom was developed. These cards are what carry the instructions that are read by the apparatus on the second floor that tells the loom what pattern to create. The holes in the cards are read by a series of pins up in the apparatus, and those holes tell the apparatus which threads down here should be raised for each pass of my shuttle across the warp. Some of you might recognize these cards as looking similar to computer punch cards. Back in the early days of computer technology, punch cards carried the instructions that told the early computers what kind of calculations to do. So this loom is the great, great, great grandfather of the computer technology that we all use today. And that technology started with a machine that produces cloth. We will next have a short video clip on a jacquard loom in action.
We will next have a short video clip on a jacquard loom in action. In the 1780s, British entrepreneurs had set up the first large textile factories in Europe for spinning cotton. When they realized Jacquard's system could be applied to any fabric, they decided to use it. And by 1833, the British had over 100,000 looms based on Jacquard's system driving the world's biggest textile trade. When steam power came, and electricity later in the 19th century. One person could control many looms. And they were able to make very, very complicated patterns. And it wasn't just one pattern at a time. This braid loom from the end of the 19th century makes 12 identical pieces of silk braid. The complexity of the pattern was limitless. A pattern produced for the World Fair in Chicago in 1893, used more than 28,000 punch cards, laid end to end. That's almost 15 kilometers. Jacquard's machine affected the entire textile trade, wool, cotton, linen, and silk, making it possible to produce more material at lower costs and with less work. Beautiful clothes were mass-produced, and what had been luxury articles became accessible to everyone. What Jacquard could never have realized was that his invention would lead to a lot more than making fabrics easier to weave. He had found a way of writing down code that could be read by any machine designed to do it. Controlling a machine like this had far-reaching consequences. This is the essential principle of a computer. A century and a half after the revolutionary invention by Jacquard, his system of punch cards was refined and led the world into the computer age. This modern Jacquard loom may look different, but it's not. It works on the same principle. Here in Flanders, it is reviving the old textile industries by weaving a replica 15th century tapestry at an unbelievable speed of almost a thousand lines a minute. And all it needs, instead of a punch card, is this, a floppy disk. Recommended videos, the textile industry. Recommended video, John K. Flying Shuttle, 2 minutes, 28 seconds. Recommended video, Richard R. Kreitz Water Frame, 2 minutes, 12 seconds. Recommended video, Industrial Loom, 6 minutes, 36 seconds. Recommended video, Cotton Gin, Machine in Action, 3 minutes, 24 seconds. Recommended video, Inside the Cotton Gin, 10 minutes, 6 seconds. The Textile Industry, Table of Contents. Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.